Hallelujah. Glory to God. As you may notice, there's someone missing today. Uh, pastor sends his regards. He's doing good, but he's just tired. Um, yesterday he had some palpitations during the day and during the night, so he couldn't rest. So he needs to rest. Um, uh, I'm saying this not to worry you or anything, but pray, pray for him. Pray for Pastor Joe and for Pastor Christine. Um, we know as a congregation we should pray for our, our leaders, so keep us there in your prayers. So, as, as Abigail already mentioned, last week we concluded First Thessalonians. And today we're starting the second letter to the Thessalonians. Now, shortly after writing First Thessalonians, as we read in the scripture, Paul, Silas, and Timothy... They're still together, all right? So shortly after writing 1 Thessalonians, Paul received a report. We will see about this report in chapter 3. So Paul received a report that the Thessalonian church accepted a strange claim. And what was this claim? This claim was that the day of the Lord has come already. And this troubled the Thessalonians. Now, therefore, one of the reasons Paul writes this letter is to reassure, to reassure those who were terrified that the day of, of the Lord had already come. Other reasons why, why, why he wrote this, this letter is to strengthen the Thessalonians because they were going through a lot of persecution. As you remember in, from 1 Thessalonians, the Thessalonians were being persecuted, but they, they, they endured the persecution. So Paul writes the second letter to strengthen them. And another reason to why writing this letter was because of this strange claim, some members in the church didn't want to work anymore. They refused to work, to earn their own, um, their own pay, basically. So Paul writes this letter to warn them, to instruct them, to discipline them. Now, in fact, when, when, we will, when we're reading this, this letter, we will see a contrast. A contrast between 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And what's this contrast? In 1 Thessalonians... It re reflected a relationship like that of a mother. Remember, in 1 Thessalonians, we read that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were like a nursing mother towards, their children, to towards its children. So Paul, in writing 1 Thessalonians, he used words of kindness, patience. He was like a loving mother. But now, in this chapter, the tone changes. And instead of being like a mother, Paul is more like a father who disciplines his children. In fact, in this letter, Paul makes, gives blunt commands to address bad behavior, to address bad thinking. Now, after that short short introduction let's go let's go today's today's text and today's message is it's quite a hard one to to deliver but it's it's important and i pray for god's grace to help me to deliver this message not to con condemn anyone but to encourage you the me the, the title for today's message is god's righteous judgment I'm going to repeat that. 
God's righteous judgment. Now, as it is Paul's custom, he opens the letter with greetings. We saw this many times. Paul starts his letters by greeting the church, his fellow workers. So he greets the Thessalonians here again. He gives thanksgiving, he gives thanksgiving, and also commendations, praises. He praises the Thessalonian church for their salvation. He praises the Thessalonian church for their genuine conversion. And why am I saying this? Let's go in verse 1. Paul starts this letter by saying, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in just this verse, we see that the Thessalonians were in God. And they were also in Jesus Christ. Now let's ask this question to ourselves. Are we in God? Are we in Jesus? This was evidence for Paul that the conversion the Thessalonians had was genuine. Because they were in God. They were in Christ. The Thessalonians were born again Spirit-filled, God-fearing people. And remember that phrase, God-fearing people. Then, Paul goes on thanking God. Why does he thank God? He thanked God because the Thessalonians were growing in sanctification. Let's ask this question to ourselves again. Are we growing in sanctification? Paul, in verse 3, writes, Your faith is growing abundantly. Is our faith growing? And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So the Thessalonians were growing in sanctification. Their faith was growing and their love for each other was increasing. Is our faith growing? Is our love towards each other increasing? Are we growing in sanctification? Paul goes on saying, Therefore, we boast about you in the churches of God. And why does Paul boast about this church? Do you remember Paul just spent a couple of weeks in Thessalonica? So do you think he went around other churches boasting about this church because he planted this church only in a couple of weeks? Ah, Paul and I boast about the Thessalonians because they were so receptive of my message in two weeks time I started this church. Do you think that's why he boasted about them? Or he was boasting about the Thessalonian church because they had an amazing church set up with the best music, with the best lights, best technology, whatever it is. Best speakers. Do you think that's why he was boasting about the Thessalonian church? No. He was boasting about the Thessalonian church because of their steadfastness. He was boasting about the Thessalonians because of their faith. He was boasting about the Thessalonians for their endurance in the midst of persecution and affliction. Think about those words. Do you think there is someone that can boast, let's say, about this church? Using the same words. Ah, the church of word of life, they're growing in faith, they're growing in obedience, they're growing in love, they're enduring persecution and affliction. Let's ask these questions for ourselves. Then Paul goes on saying that all of this, all the things that the Thessalonians are going through, is the evidence, is the proof that God 
is working through the Thessalonians, working in the Thessalonians, so they are able to live a life worthy of God. Enduring persecution was the evidence that God is working in them, so they can enjoy eternal life. Are we living a life worthy of God? Now, starting from verse 6 up, up to verse 10, Paul changes his tone again. So first, he starts with greetings, then thanksgivings, he's boasting about this church. Then in verse 9, the tone changes. And it seems like these verses are out of place. Now, keep in mind that in a very brief letter, 2 Thessalonians just has three short chapters. Now, a short letter addressed to a church full of love, full of faith, full of hope, we find some of the most terrifying words ever revealed from her. We find such an explicit warning of God's eternal judgment. On a side note, some teach that, that Paul was a judgment preacher. They say Paul was a judgment preacher, but Jesus wasn't. They say Jesus preached love, Jesus preached forgiveness, he preached mercy, and sometimes we have this image of Jesus in our head, and we consider Jesus as one of those hippies during the 80s. Oh, bro, love, peace, well. That's the way many people picture Jesus. It's true, Jesus preached love, he preached forgiveness, he preached mercy. But Jesus was more of a judgment preacher than Paul. In fact, Jesus was a hellfire preacher. And in many times, Jesus preached about hell. And one of those verses is Matthew chapter 10, verses 28. And these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Mercy, these are the words of Jesus. The world, this world, has become so accustomed to God's mercy. So accustomed to God's patience so accustomed to God's grace that it freely and joyfully exhibits its sinfulness. This world takes God's grace for granted. And without any shame, it displays <coughs> its sinfulness. Now, Scripture tells us that there is no fear of God in the eyes of of men. And if there is no fear of God, there is no fear of judgment. And if there is no fear of judgment, there is no fear of hell. Actually, some today think that hell is a cool place. Did you ever, did you ever notice that? If you see it on, on social media, people are boasting that they're going to hell because they'll have a great party with Satan in heaven. They'll be drinking whiskey with Satan, dancing with Satan. They have no idea. Lord have mercy. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 reads, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and let's read verses 6, 7 and 8. Verse 6 Since indeed God considers it just to repay with, affli with affliction those 
who afflict you. Verse 7. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Listen to this. Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God. And inflicting vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, it's important that we keep this in mind. God's vengeance is not like man's vengeance. God is holy, God is just, and He avenges sin and evil justly. His punishment is just and his vengeance is righteous. Romans chapter 12 verse 19 reads, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So brothers and sisters, let us not take vengeance in our own hands, because without any doubt, our vengeance will be motivated by selfishness and by sin. But leave it to God. And the Son, Jesus Christ, will be the instrument of that vengeance. What am I saying? God uses Jesus as an instrument to bring vengeance. Let's take a look at the words of Jesus. Jesus in Luke 20 verse 18 says this word and this is, he is referring to himself everyone who falls on that stone referring to himself will be broken to pieces and when it falls on anyone it will crush him Jesus is saying these words about himself those who don't accept Jesus will be eventually broken, will be broken by him. And those who defy Jesus, those who freely go against Jesus, will be crushed under his judgment. So on his return, Jesus will inflict vengeance on two types of people we read here. Jesus will inflict vengeance on those who don't know God. And secondly, he will inflict vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, knowing God is foundation. In his high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, and this is eternal life. What is eternal life? That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So to know God is foundation. But then you find someone, and he brings up that remote tribe in the, in the jungles of Africa. But what about the tribe, poor, poor people? They never had the opportunity to hear about God. But do you remember what Paul said in Romans 1? No one has any excuse. Because the truth was available to reason and creation. And no one has any excuse in Romans 2. Because the truth was available through the moral law written on the heart. So, when we hear these words, it should stir up something in us. We have an obligation, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel. So, the Great Commission is fulfilled. Then, on the other hand, there are some people who may know about God, but 
don't know God. There's a huge difference. There's a difference in knowing about God and knowing God Himself. In, in fact, in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, we read this. They profess to know God, but they deny Him. They deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. As harsh as it may sound, there is a hell for those who don't know about God. And there is a hell for those who know about God but don't know God personally. Let's not forget Matthew chapter 7. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? Remember, there were some disciples, they approached him and they told him, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And what did Jesus tell them? Get away. I never knew you. You workers of iniquity. So brothers and sisters, it's important that we examine ourselves. Are we in Christ? Is our conversion genuine? Let's not deceive ourselves. Then Jesus will justly punish those who don't obey the gospel. Now let's keep this in mind. We either obey the gospel or disobey the gospel. The gospel is a command. The gospel is not a story. And God wants all men, God commands all men to repent and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But Jesus, on, a, on another note, will come also to give relief. He will come to give rest. Let's read verse 6 and 7. Verse 6. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. And the words there, as to us, encompasses all born again, spirit filled, God fearing believers. Now, I'm a person that enjoys life. I consider life as, as a blessing from God. Life is beautiful. I enjoy it. But I also know that this life doesn't have much to offer. This life is full of trouble. With just a brief moment of rest. With just a brief moment of relief. But when Jesus comes, what a glorious day it will be. Jesus will put an end to all the persecution. He will grant relief from the lust of the flesh, from the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He will put an end to all sort of temptation, sicknesses, and heat waves. And I look forward for that. No more heat waves. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> no more power cuts. Wow. <laughs> there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain. But we will enjoy life eternal with King Jesus. Now you may be asking yourself, but we won't be going through all these things. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read about the rapture. But if that's your attitude, then you better think twice. <coughs> We shouldn't be passive about this. Many people think, ah, by the time we'll be raptured, we, won't, we don't have to worry about all of this. But as I said, let's not play with fire. Let's not deceive ourselves. Let's make sure that we are 
in Christ. We are in God. And I know these end times uh, prophecies and eschatology and um, stirs up curiosity. In chapter 2 we'll be talking about the Antichrist, the tribulation, and many of us are curious about these things. But it's important to keep in mind that the central figure of end time prophecy is Jesus Christ. So from the beginning of the Holy World till the end, Jesus is always the central figure. In the rapture, Christ catches away those who are his. In the tribulation, Christ overcomes Satan and the Antichrist. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, Christ is forever united with his bride. During the millennium, Christ is king over all the earth. And in the New Jerusalem, again, there will be no power cuts because Jesus will be the lamp that lights the city. Oh, these, these things should excite us. These things should stir up an excitement, longing for the return of Jesus. But at the same time, these words should help us to examine ourselves, to keep our eyes on Jesus, to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to go seek for the lost. Because if we won't go through this judgment, our family members, our unsaved family members, our friends, colleagues, even people in the church might have to face this judgment. Man, this is, this is, this is terrifying. We love to hear about God's grace, about God's mercy. But as Paul preached judgment, Jesus preached judgment, we have to preach judgment also. We have to keep people alert. We have to stay alert. We have to stay focused, stay on that narrow path, so we can enjoy our Lord Jesus for eternity. This is the plan for eternity. An eternity in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let Him be Lord in Jesus' name. I pray that Although this is a hard message, a tough message, I pray that the Lord, with these words, encourages us, that the Holy Spirit will pinch us if we've been lazy in our spiritual walk, in our good Christian life. This is the time that we wake up, we stand up, we stay sharp, stay alert, and truly live a life worthy of God. Truly live a life totally surrendered, offer ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you in Jesus' name.